Oh. Oh no. This is too slow. James, these days are way too demanding. My high-end 486 machine is just not enough. What should I do? Hello everyone, Athetos here. And yeah, this is a video that probably a lot of you were waiting for. It's finally time to have some uh, overclocking and underclocking fun with this uh, AM5X86 CPUs. And all that, of course, it's gonna happen on my heavily modded Soyo for SAW motherboard. Now you have seen this motherboard on a few of my other videos, but unfortunately I have never done a proper full review on this. So there are a few topics that I have still not covered here, like the jumper or BIOS settings, and we will discuss a little bit about this today. But of course the main focus of the video is the AM5X86, and more or less the upper and the lower limit here. Now there are many variants of these chips, and here I have the two most common ones, the 133ADW and the 133ADZ. There are also a lot of other ones, and there is a lot of speculation of uh, what type of chip overclocks the best. But after testing more than 10 of these, I think the actual marking here does not really matter. And in the end it's all on the silicon lottery. In other words, you just have to get lucky. Now the main model here is a 5x86, but in reality these are for sure just the 486 chips. And there are actually only a few differences from the original 486DX. The first one is that these ones are implemented using a newer node. Yeah, these are uh, 500 nanometers, these are 350 nanometers. And that means uh, less heat, higher clocks, and in general better overclocking. The second difference is that, okay, this has 8 kilobytes of L1 CAS, while these ones have 16 kilobytes. And the final difference is a minor one. The DX4 has a multiplier of 3 that uh, can be set to 2 while the 5x86 has a multiplier of 4 that can be changed to 3. So 2 or 3 multiplier here, 3 or 4 here. Other than that, yeah, the cores are exactly the same. So let's also have a look online to see some other models. And uh, here I have selected all the 486 CPUs from AMD at uh, 500 nanometers. And for sure all these are the older models of uh, DX2 and DX4 with only 8 kilobytes of level 1 CAS. So here all the model numbers end at 8B or 8T. 8 of course is for the 8 kilobytes, and B is for write back CAS, while T is for write through CAS. In general write back is faster, and the write back models can also operate in a write through mode. Now if I change to 350 nanometers, here of course we have the AM5X86, but actually there were also some uh, DX2s and DX4s that were manufactured by the same process. And the way to tell apart these models is here, where you have this marking with 16. This indicates 16 kilobytes of level 1 CAS. So yeah, in the end these chips also have exactly the same core as the 5X86. Now I have a few of these uh, DX2s and DX4s, and I confirm that uh, yeah, the only difference is in the multiplier selection where you just have the options two times or three times. Some 5x86 are also marked in a similar way. So here they have this 133V16. Again, all the chips are more or less the same. So now back to our motherboard. And first of all, let's talk about a few problems that I had here. And I don't know why, but uh, this PCI slots here were just a little bit too sensitive, with uh, VGA cards not uh, making a good contact. The same goes true for the SIM modules, and I don't know if the construction of the particular connectors used here is just not that good, or okay, after 20 years there is some oxidation, maybe. In the end everything worked, but yeah, okay, even the smallest movement here could uh, make the system freeze. I might try to replace this in the future, but yeah, this for sure it's a lot of work, so this is for another day. And then regarding memories, I tried some Edo ones, but most of them did not post. One managed to post, but uh, then freezed during booting. And yeah, I don't really know what to say, as uh, the chipset here, this uh, Sys85C496, 
clearly supports the DRAM. Yeah, the nice thing here is that the dataset of this chipset is available. And to my understanding, has an auto routine for detecting a DRAM and then set some flags regarding that. Of course, I have also seen other motherboards with this chipset working just fine with a DRAM. So the Edo topic, okay, for now it uh, just doesn't work. So today I just used uh, some uh, normal fast page uh, RAM that I had here. These chips are 60 nanosecond ones. And with this I was more or less able to max out all the settings in the BIOS regarding memory, except maybe from one. Then I also tried my 45 and 50 nanosecond uh, SIM30 modules that I have with some adapter. But again there was no difference. So in the end, uh, yeah, okay, I just uh, stuck with these modules. Then regarding the CAS here, the motherboard came in with 256 kilobytes of level 2 CAS. The chips are all marked at uh, 15 nanoseconds. In theory the maximum here is 512 kilobytes. However, the chipset here can in theory support up to 1 megabyte of level 2 CAS, interleaved in two banks. Now you bet that uh, I have already tried some other chips here. I tried the 512 uh, kilobyte option, but in this case I had to reduce the timings of the CAS and the result was exactly the same. I have also tried some other chips that were marked uh, minus 10 or minus 12, but again there was no difference. Yeah, in general I wasted so much time here experimenting with stuff without gaining anything more. Yeah, I don't know what's really going on here. In general for my test looks like that the timings of the CAS are the hardest ones to please, and especially on high bus frequencies. So for today we are with the default CAS chips and just some fast page mode RAM, but in the future I will have of course to revisit all these topics. Now finally regarding jumpers, okay this is a classic 486 motherboard, so you have this chaos here. One interesting thing is this position where you can select the multiplier for the CPU. So if it is unconnected, this is the 3x multiplier for this one. But if I place a jabber here, now this is set to 4x. And this setting also affects, as we said, the DX4 and allows you to select between 2 or 3 multiplier. Then another thing that I try to do here is to set the L1 cask to write back or write through. And if we see here on the jabber settings, and we compare the DX4-8T with the DX4-8B. The only difference is on these two jumpers. This is the GP30, GP31. Yeah, here is the GP30 and here is the GP31. Now the strange thing is that I changed these settings and uh, nothing changed. The CPU remained on the right back mode. Then I had a look on the manual of the CPU and uh, you have this pin here, the right back right through bar. And for sure this pin is checked on every reset. And if it is high, the CPU works in right back mode. If it is low, it works in right through mode. And it also in theory has an internal weak pull down resistor. Now I track this pin on the motherboard and it actually connects in this pin here. So this is the GP37, the third pin from the bottom. And while in the manual of the CPU it said that it has a pull down, if you measure here the voltage, it was at 5 volt, and that explains also that the default here is right back mode. So then if you pull down this, uh, I used a 1K resistor just to be safe, and connected this to the ground. Ground is actually the pin immediately next to it. So yeah, this is how this looks in the end. And yeah, by doing so, I was able to finally force the L1 cast here to write through mode. Now the performance was significantly lower, maybe 20% lower. So all this is not that useful, but either way I thought it would be a good idea to give you all this additional information. So let's now see the rest of the hardware. And for hard disk I just used this uh, little disk on module this time. This plugs directly into the ID port and then you just have to provide some power here. There is also a switch to select between master and slave, and in general, okay, these are nice alternatives to CF cards. I think it's also a little bit faster actually. Then VGA cards, of course, we are gonna use some PCI ones, and this is not that straightforward. You see, you need a PCI card that can handle very high clock speeds, but also the most uh, modern ones are not supported by this chipset. You see, the implementation here is not complete, and so for sure, newer ones will never work. Now regarding high clock speeds, 
as long the card has also an AGP version, it should easily work to clock speeds up to 66 MHz. You see these early AGP cards basically use exactly the same chip as the PCI counterpart. And the first AGP was basically electrically the same as a 66 MHz PCI slot. So from all the cards I tested, I have here the ones that worked uh, just fine. And first of all, from ATI, I have a 3D Rage Pro. Yeah, later ATI models, I don't know. They just gave a correct beep code, but never displayed anything in the output. And older ones didn't have an AGP version, so maybe this is one of the few that are compatible here. Then from 3D Labs, there is this Permedia 2. Again, this also has an AGP version, so it worked just fine. I didn't have the chance to test earlier or later versions of this. But yeah, okay, this is one more option. Then from S3 we have this Savage 4. Yeah, a very good option too. And also in contrast to the S3 Avirge and Trio stuff, this also has a working 3D engine. So not bad at all. From Nvidia I have, okay, the very first uh, Riva 128. This also worked just fine. And then you can also use a TNT. I tried a TNT 2 M64, but this didn't work, as uh, also all the later models. With these cards, okay, the system doesn't do anything, doesn't even beep. Now I don't know about the full TNT 2 version, but I will have this also very soon. So for now I can only recommend from Nvidia the original Riva 128 or the TNT. And then finally, we go to the 3DFX cards, and here is a Voodoo Bungie and a Voodoo 3 2000, both uh, work just fine. So all these cards are models that will work just fine here and with very high bus clocks. And regarding those 2D performance, yeah, all are more or less the same. However, okay, the 3DFX cards are in general a little bit faster. The other cards can match the 3DFX performance in some benchmarks, but usually lack a little bit behind in one or two of them. So all the cards are good options actually, but in the end uh, the best ones are uh, the 3DFX. Now I don't have any other 3DFX PCI cards, but I suspect that all of this should work just fine. And in the end the DOS uh, both performed exactly the same. Now okay, technically if we also get into account the uh, Windows 3D performance, the higher the model the better. But for sure these high-end models are uh, totally overkill for a 486 machine like we have here. And okay, even this Voodoo 3 2000 is an overkill. So taking everything into account, in the end probably the most reasonable option is the Bungie. And yeah, this is what I finally used here in the end. Now for further comparison between cards, I think I have to run some Windows. But okay, this is for sure a topic for another video. Now the final piece of the puzzle is of course cooling, and here I use the Peltier element, and this, uh, yeah, it's not that big actually, tower cooler, so quite basic stuff. This setup here allows you to have the CPU below the freezing point. That is mandatory here if you want to overclock the CPUs uh, past uh, 180 MHz. Yeah, even the best samples will not clock higher without some freezing. Now the bad thing about all this is that while you run this you will get a lot of ice around this area and of course due to that I cannot run it for a long period but in the end if you want to go for the records you have no option so this is what I also did here and that is all for the hardware time to have a look on the BIOS so as you can see here this is my original BIOS and it's a very old version 13 of November 95 and first of all okay you should start with the load setup defaults. These are the most close to optimal. And then BIOS feature setup. And yeah, here are the standard stuff. Of course, you can enable or disable the CASES. And then here is another interesting option. This basically allows you to set or reset the turbo function from the BIOS. So you can have permanently enabled the turbo with the jumper. And then just come here to disable it. So this actually halves the CPU speed. And of course this is something very useful with our other clocking experiments. For now of course I will set it to high. And the rest of the things here are not that important. Then chipset feature setup. And here are all the timings of the board. 
So first of all, okay, you have to disable the auto configuration and then, okay, the first section here is for the ESA bus and the IO. Here I will put this. It's not important as we are not using any ESA cards. This option here affects significantly the VGA speeds and T2 is the best option. Then here you have the cast timing options and of course the lower the better. My best options here are 2, 1, 2. But on higher bus speeds above 50 MHz I have to change this to 3, 2, 2. Then here are all the DRAM timings. And this, the first one, is the only one that I couldn't drop to 2. As there the system was only posting and not booting. So this is 3. And then the rest I was able to minimize. So that here we have 0, 1, 1, fastest. And slow refresh enabled. This means that the DRAM will refresh more rarely and so gives better performance. With very low bus speeds, you probably need to have this disabled or the system will be unstable. So yeah, here enable. Then here are some final stuff for the level 2 CAS, so the CAS that is on the board. And you can set it to write back or write through. And you also have this CPU burst write option. Now I had a look at the dataset of the chipset. And I also run a few tests here. And in the end there are only two ways that you should ever set uh, these three options. If you go for write back, it's a good idea to have also enabled the CPU burst write, as it increases a little bit the performance. And then this field here should always be at 7 bits. The reason is that if you go for 8 bits, then the system does not have the extra bit that it needs for the dirty bit flag, and so the performance suffers. So yeah, with write back, this is the optimal setting. Then with write through, you should disable the burst write as it hurts the performance. And then this 7 or 8 does not make any difference in performance. However, with this option at 8, you can actually cast a larger amount of memory. In general, the amount of memory that you can cast is equal to the size of the cast multiplied by 2 in the power of this number here, that is 8. So basically here I have 256 kilobytes of CAS. 2 to the power of 7 is 128. 2 to the power of 8 is 256. So if you do the calculations with this setting, you can CAS up to 32 megabytes of RAM. And here up to 64 megabytes of RAM. Now in my case I have only 16 megabytes of RAM and adding more does not help at any way with those benchmarks. So either way this setting is not important that I will leave it at 7. Now the right back option looks like it's the fastest one in all benchmarks with the only exception of Quake. So in the end I'm gonna use this setup here for all the other benchmarks but on Quake I will change to something like that. Now the rest here is about the IO devices. And usually I'd like to disable everything here as I'm not using it. Yeah, this even allows you to completely disable the I.O. chip. Then ID prefers to read the buffer. If you enable here, you get a little bit better performance. And I will leave only the first ID channel enabled. So yeah, this is my final configuration for high pass speeds. Then another final important menu is here, the PCI configuration setup. And this okay, you don't want to change something here. But make sure that these three final options are all enabled. As, yeah, with this also you get a boost on the VGA performance. Yeah, quite important, all enabled. So that's all the BIOS settings. I just have to note here that all this information is probably also applicable to your 486 motherboard with this SIS chipset. If you are missing any of these options, yeah, this is an outward BIOS. So you can edit it with modbin and add them back. My BIOS here, uh, yeah, okay, had already everything enabled, so nothing more to unlock here. However, there is always also this uh, took BIOS tool, and this chipset is supported. This tool directly manipulates the configuration registers of the chipset. And yeah, you might have a few more options that are typically not in the BIOS. And one extra option is this PCI concurrency. However, I enabled, disabled this and had no effect. And then there are some options here for the ID. I don't know, this definitely affects the performance of the ID drive. But yeah, again, I don't know, I couldn't figure out an option that will give better performance here. So in the end, yeah, that's all with the BIOS settings. 
and you cannot gain mats with either modbin or this tool here. So the time is now to talk about overclocking. And well, yeah, the world record is at 200 megahertz with a 66.6 .6 megahertz bus and a multiplier of three. That was achieved, of course, by CPU Galaxy. He actually used a 486 motherboard with the same SIS chipset and some uh, Edo DRAM. So his timings were actually quite a bit different than mine. So this comparison here is quite interesting. Yeah, we totally have different timings. In my case, okay, when I first put here the any clock device. I tested the three 5x86 CPUs that I had and one of them was able to clock to 192 MHz with a bus of 64. Then I tried a lot of things. I even got maybe 10 more CPUs and none clocked this high. Then I played a lot with a CAS, as I said, but nothing really helped me improve the performance or the timings here. So the only thing I managed to improve here is that uh, before, in order to get this 192 megahertz speed, I had to set the CPU voltage at 4 volts, while now this is completely stable at uh, 3.9. Okay, at this speed, with 3.6 volt, it doesn't even post. 3.7 it posts, but it doesn't boot. 3.8 it boots, it runs some benchmark, but uh, yeah, in Doom it crashes. And okay, as I said, 3.9 it was completely stable. 4 or 4.1 didn't help me go any higher. So in the end, yeah, here we are, 3 times 64. And these are my optimal timings here. Alternatively, I can also run the system with 4 times 48. That also gives exactly the same final speed of 192 megahertz. But in this case, I can run the CAS with better timings. I will give all these results in the final table. But of course, in the end, uh, the best performance is with 3 times 64. So let's boot this. So okay, here I still have this DOS ID driver. It works even here with the integrated ID controller. But I don't know, this time the boost is only 5-6%. So let's go check a few things. So first of all, let's have a look on the CPU check tool. And we get 3 times 64. Yeah, okay, it's reported 3 times 64.3 for a total of uh, 193. And of course the L1 CAS, if you see in the bottom, is in the right back mode. When I did the mode with a 1K resistor and forced it to the right through mode, here was correctly detected. So this tool is quite good with 486 CPUs if you want to see their status. Then let's see the other information tools. Yeah, okay, landmark is probably too fast for a 486. But either way, this is what I'm getting here. Then uh, system information. Okay, this one fails to detect the CPU correctly. And the score here is absolutely unreal. Nearly two times a Pedium 66. Then uh, let's look at speeds. Here everything is detected correctly. Uh, the CPU type, the frequency. The total score is 72.26. And uh, yeah, one interesting thing is here compared to the CPU Galaxy results. My memory bandwidth is lower than his. But all my cast speeds and the memory throughput speeds are actually higher. Yeah, all this is probably because of the very different timings we have. Then cast check tool. And uh, yeah, these are the results here. This tool, I think, is the only one that reports the CPU frequency completely correctly. Then a little bit of check it. And first some real-time clock check. Just to verify that there's nothing funny with the reference clock. And yeah, everything is fine here. Then this is the main system benchmark. Interesting enough, this is only affected by the total CPU speed. So both my configuration with uh, 3x multiplier and 4x multiplier performed exactly the same here. Yeah, of course, uh, the video system benchmark is a totally different case. And here the hard disk benchmark. Yeah, okay, just for reference. Then here some VGA speed. Yeah, 250 frames per second. And this is bit speed. Okay, here some extra floating point performance test the CPR for DOS and 88.5 seconds is actually quite fast while the compatibility here is what you would expect it is the same as the 486DX2 so time for the real benchmarks and 3D bands with option 2 
yeah this is super fast 109.7 then Chris Reed events and 80.3 PC player benchmark with option 5 And this is 28.9 Then Doom full details Yeah, this is also very fast This is 71.1 frames per second And then of course time for some quake And yeah, okay, this is 20.2 However, this is my right back result So now I will go back to BIOS to change it to right through So here I disable the CPU birth to right And I change this to right through So here we go again And the score this time is 20.4 frames per second. Now the world record is 21.6. So yeah, okay, I'm something like 5-6% less. But either way, okay, I'm happy with this result. So here are now all the results. And uh, yeah, first I have the 3x64 setup. With uh, slower cast timings. Right through and right back. Then the 4x48 with better cast timings again with the right through and right back. Then here is the world record from CPU Galaxy 3x66.6 at 200 MHz. Now I have these question marks here because, okay, in my case the clock is generated by the only clock device and I know for sure the exact frequency. However, with the motherboard clock generators, these numbers are never exact. The only way to really tell the real clock is with my PCI clock devices. And uh, he was using one in the video, but the display was not visible. So I cannot tell his exact uh, bus clock, and so the exact CPU clock. But the former one was probably between 66 and 67 MHz. If we assume that it was exactly 66.6, then the difference from 64 that I had here is 4.2%. Other than that, okay, our differences are with the cache and memory timings and also in the fact that uh, he was using Adobe RAM that according to the chipset manual it is probably timed a little bit more aggressively even when using exactly the same timings in the BIOS. So, let's see now. So, okay, here with green are my best results and uh, here I have a comparison between having right through and right back level to cache and yeah, in all benchmarks, right back wins and only loses in Quake. But in total, more or less, these two are the same. Then here the comparison with my configuration of uh, 3x or 4x multiplier. And okay, in everything the 3x multiplier wins, but the total difference is only 4%. Now the main difference here is, okay, the 3x multiplier has a higher bus speed and so a higher VGA speed. So for sure the difference is higher on all benchmarks that the frame rate is higher. But then again the difference is very small on PC player benchmark and Quake. And if we see closer here, in Quake, in right through mode, the difference is only 0.1 frame per second. So this configuration might also have some value and I will have also to check it again in the future. Then finally here okay is the comparison between the gold record from uh, CPU Galaxy and my best results and of course I'm losing everywhere the biggest difference is actually in the PC player benchmark and Doom yeah probably due to our different memory setup and on average I'm losing by 6.8% now I hope I didn't disappoint you too much with these results but I mean in the end okay this is just my first try 
However, I have to note here that uh, beating the world record is nearly impossible. Because in the end, no matter what you do, the number one factor for the maximum frequency here is the CPU lottery. So I might manage to beat the world record at the end, but this will take time and I will have to do some unconventional things. So we will see. So yeah, time for some underclocking now. And the motivation here is to reach uh, IBM XT performance. You see, it could be very nice to have a system that can basically run everything from the early IBM XT era to the early 3D games. And to demonstrate this point, I have here a few IBM XT games. And let's see how this run on a typical 486 machine. <laughs> and yeah, this is completely unplayable. Yeah, same goes for this. Okay, this is maybe partially playable. But definitely very hard to do so. Okay, and of course Defender does not even start. <laughs> Behaves very strangely. I have to note that, okay, using the turbo function has no effect. It just halves uh, the performance. But this is still way, way too fast. So yeah, it's time to slow this down a bit. And first of all, okay, I'm gonna disable all the cases internally and external. Then the boot up uh, system speed to low. This is the turbo function. Then someone could probably disable the video bio shadow. But this will just make the DOS menus go super slow and it doesn't have a real effect in most games. So I will keep this enabled, but okay, you can try this. Then of course here I will put everything to slow. So this T3, this 3, 2, 3, this 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, slowest, disabled, and this is irrelevant either way. Okay, all the cast settings are irrelevant. Now at this point, uh, okay, we had already a significant decrease in speed, but this is not enough. And of course, now it's the time to use my AnyClock device. I will put a 2.5 MHz crystal and putting there the setting uh, 2x, that is the smallest multiplier. The AnyClock device generates a bus clock of 5 MHz. This 5 MHz multiplied by 3 is 15 MHz for the CPU. But uh, then, due to the turbo function, the final CPU speed is 7.5 MHz. Yeah, this is a 7.5 MHz 5x86 CPU with a 2.5 MHz bus. I couldn't really go any lower, as the system does not uh, even post. So let's see this. And of course, posting, booting, and everything here is <laughs> super slow. <laughs> Look how slowly it counts the RAM, it's ridiculous. The CPU speed is not reported correctly here, because of course you never expect a 7.5 MHz 486. But we will check also the other tools to see what they have to say. Of course not all of them, because yeah, I need one hour for each one of them to run. Yeah, look at this menu. I think I will go with uh, tech CPU. Hmm, and that is interesting. The CPU is reported here even lower. Maybe the turbo faction here does not half the CPU speed, but actually divides by three. And this is landmark, let's see. Yeah, this is below scale. And it's also reported very low, 6.5 megahertz. Then I will run the cast check tool. It will never finish, but at least I know that it gives the correct CPU speed. 7.1. Yeah, guys, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the real speed is here. All these numbers. First time I see a thousand hundred something here. And the final answer of how close we are to an IBM XT will come, of course, from check it. Let's see the main system here. This is reported 7.5 megahertz. Who knows, maybe this is the correct answer. And yeah, okay. 
The integer CPU speed is around half that of an IBM XT. Yeah, okay, the floating point unit is way faster, but no games back then used it, so it's okay, I think. So that means that if we increase the clock speed a little bit here, we can somewhat match the original IBM XT. However, of course, we will never be cycle accurate. And depending the game, you might want to go a little bit higher or lower. But yeah, in theory, every game of this era should be playable now. So, okay, let's check again our games. This is the one that ran so fast that you couldn't even see anything. It's a very nice game with very hard controls. Oh, oh no. This is too slow. Games these days are way too demanding. My high-end 486 machine is just not enough. What should I do? Yeah, oh, this is clearly too slow here. But I suppose if you want to cheat, you can use it to cheat. Let's see round 42. Yeah, this is extremely slow too. By the way, the graphics here are a little bit broken, because this game really needs an EGA card. Now Defender this time loads correctly. And yeah, this one, because it is one of the most challenging games for fast systems, actually plays really well here. Yeah, this looks very nice. So for the other two, I think we have to increase a little bit the speed. And I will just go with a 4 MHz crystal that in theory gives a 12 MHz CPU. 4 MHz is also one of the default crystals you get with uh, any clock device. So first of all, uh, real quick uh, check it. Yeah, we are at 12 MHz now. 0 0.84 times the IBM XT. Let's also see the video one. Again 0 0.83. So in theory we are still below the IBM XT. Okay, you can just change the jumpers and set the bus at 5 MHz and the CPU at 15. However, this is probably okay now, let's see. In the end these games are very hard, either way. And a little bit of slowdown is okay, I think. Oh, this looks quite good. Yeah, I think this looks good now. In theory you can put here an EGA card and uh, also play this with corrected graphics. However, I don't know, the EGA card worked uh, fine on my 386 machine. Here I had a few problems. So this is something to check again in the future. Okay, now this is flight and it looks more playable still a little bit slow here maybe yeah it's okay So here we are, we did it. To understand how ridiculous this is, this is getting performance of an 8088 CPU at, uh, I don't know, 5 megahertz out of this machine. Yeah, quite nice. So here we are for the final conclusions. 
In the overclocking part, okay, of course we didn't manage to beat the gold record, but these results are actually quite good. I have not seen many reaching these levels of performance, and for sure it's a good start, and either way I wanted just to make this video to set my initial channel record here. Once I have something better, that will probably come out of some crazy mode, I will come back to you of course. Now on the underclocking part, we reached performance levels that are actually below that of an IBM XT, and that is a significant achievement. So this system here can actually run really everything, from the very first PC games to the early 3D games with a Glide or, I don't know, Dealquake, as uh, CPU Galaxy also demonstrated on his video. So in the end, if you combine something like that uh, with a, I don't know, an Athlon XP machine, you can probably run everything that your main PC cannot run. Now the real question is, okay, I did this underclocking with a 386 machine, I did it now with a 486 machine, what is the limit here? I think this is also possible with a socket 4 Pedium machine, but I have to try this. For sure with socket 5 and later machines this looks impossible, but okay, for now the only sure thing is, yeah, 486. So, that was for today, I hope uh, you liked this video. Show me your love below, as you always do with messages and likes. And of course subscribe so that you don't lose any updates here. So that is all. Uh, yeah, see you again next time.